Idiot Radio, taking it to the edge and back. All right, so welcome to Scotty Presents. I'm your host, Scott Israel. We have comedian Michael Cohen with us today. How you doing, Michael? Oh, I'm great, Scotty. How you doing? I'm doing good. I first got to know Michael Cohen on a, a, a long car ride we had out from Pittsburgh to central Pennsylvania. Out, out to, is it Wilkes Bar or wilkes Barre? I don't know or care. It's a, a tiny town. All right, so how how did that's cool? How how did how did how did we end up there in the first place? I don't even remember. I mean, I had a great time. It was a great show. Me, I I killed you, killed Eric Sabin, killed David Lawrence, killed. It was a, it was a it was a fun night. They gave us steak, but how how did we get that gig? How did we end up there? Um, I think I was on it with someone else, and they bailed. And I I contacted you and was like, "Yo, are you trying to do this show? Is, uh, is that not how it happened?" That that sounds right to me. And I'm re- I'm really glad that we got to do that because while I was driving with my knee at 100 miles an hour, and you were gripping onto my dashboard for dear life, hoping that we wouldn't wreck, even though I was fairly confident that we wouldn't, and we got there I- I- on time and in safety. Uh, uh, we we had we had some we had some great conversations about uh, the way you both view and interact with modern American society. Wow. And it's not really it's not a question. Uh, so I guess I guess I guess to, to open it, I really I really want to give people a real initial feel about. I mean, because your stand up reflects your your opinions and your thoughts and your interaction with the way society is going. Um, it's it's deep deep flaws and how we don't really combat it in a in a way that would result in in anything positive i mean yeah i think we're sold uh a lot of solutions you know i I mean we we live in capitalism and so i think uh as soon as there's a demand for something there's people selling some version of it and i think we have we have green capitalism now right where like yeah if you want to feel like you're doing something to save the planet and stop you know the next great extinction or whatever, then there is someone who will sell you hemp pants that claim that they do that, you know, and there's someone who will, uh, you know, contract with your city to help you sort your garbage Mm -hmm. in a way that makes you feel like your garbage isn't garbage. Right. And at the same time, I I remember a case in the Midwest where a guy put a, a, a power turbine onto a river that ran through his property that he owned and they gave him 10 years for for that in prison um so i i mean i'm i i i can buy into the idea that uh that all the su- solutions are not only very expensive very impractical and like i have a prius and i and i got this thing it's got great gas mileage and i'm glad that i have it but i bought it in hopes that i would reduce my my uh carbon footprint on the world and then uh like a year after i got it somebody came up to me and said you know there's no way to stop the lithium ion battery from poisoning the earth once the car is no longer in use and uh and I think that's something that would really resonate with you i mean what do, what do you what do you think what, what it, the solution to our problems that we were we're being sold are illusions i mean yeah, I think so i well i think the the thing that they all take for granted is that this is the way that we should be living. Right. You know, that that this is the best way to live, 
and that whatever way we find to stay on this planet is going to look almost exactly like the way we live now, right? Where it's like, okay, so like cars are a given, highways are a given, the internet is a given, right? right. Like, like the, these are viewed as like immutable shit, basically. Yeah. Like, no, no one's asking like, hey, is, is this actually the way we should be like trying to live on this planet? Right. Um, and so Do you I think get, we're just lazy and we've already got these things so we're going to keep them or you no, think no. it's a sinister plot? I mean, I don't, uh, certain, I, I think it's both, Okay. you know, I think, uh, on, I think we, I think uh, sinister plots a strong word, but I mean, I think there's a large profit motivation to <laughs> tell people that they can keep all these things, and right. I think that we love to be told that we can keep them. <laughs> yeah, you for know? sure. For sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I love air conditioning as much as the next person. Oh, and indoor yeah. plumbing, for sure. Yeah, I mean, they're they're really great. They're, um... The, the trappings of society really are fantastic. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you know, and, and it's the kind of thing where, it, you know, I think there's like... There's two kinds of people. There are like people with a martyr complex who are like, even if no one else gives up their AC, I'll do it, you know? Yeah. And then there's other people who are like, even if everyone else gave up their AC, I wouldn't do it, you sure. know? And then there's most of the people in the middle. So I guess there's three kinds, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I'm definitely, I think I'm in the middle where I'm like, if we all gave up our AC, I would absolutely do that to live on a planet that wasn't turning into a fucking alternating firestorm and flash flood. Right. You know? Um, but I'm also like not a martyr who's gonna, you know, walk around with no shoes on because part of it is, you know, the society we live in right now, it's, it's hard to make meaningful change. Like, um, as our society gets more complex and more high tech and more hierarchical, Mm -hmm. um, the variations that you can have in lifestyle, uh, and still, you know, live, uh, get smaller and smaller. And I don't mean like, like small stuff, like gay marriage, you know, legalization of marijuana, like any of these things, anything that doesn't affect the bottom line is, is permissible. You know, we're, we're going to see some crazy positive changes in our lifetime because they, because they don't affect the bottom line. Oh, I definitely think prison reform is, is, is on, I think on on the dock, but I think not because, I think once it, once they figure out a way for it to not affect the bottom line, that's right. when you'll see it. Right, right, right. Because like, right. right now there's a lot of money to be made on it. But well, yeah, the privatized... Did they end the privatized prisons? No, not at all. No. Nah. Um, but I mean, like, like one of my boys got busted for graffiti uh, a couple of years ago, and they had him... He, he, You know, they didn't put him in jail. They gave him an ankle bracelet, you know? Yeah. And they had him renting the ankle bracelet. Oh, my God. He, right? Hold on, hold on, hold on. They they rented him the ankle like he paid so that he could have the ankle bracelet on him. Yeah, he was paying like over a hundred dollars a month yeah. to borrow the ankle bracelet, right? And then since he's not in jail, they don't need to feed him. Right. They don't need to house him, right? Yeah. But he gets to pay a hundred bucks a month for drug testing, hundred bucks a month for the ankle bracelet. Right. I forget if they were charging him just for the probation officer or not. Right, I mean, it's right, a right. good scam. It's a good. You know? They're making they're making money yeah, they, doing they nothing. Cut basically all their overhead. Right. You know? Oh, that's. Sounds like a pretty... I would invest in that. I mean, not really, but the, you're going to make a couple of bucks. Um, you you want to... You, uh, okay, so you started uh, comedy in... All right, so I started in... I, I did my first set in 2013. Ooh, where did you do your first set? Um, at a place called The Nightlight in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. All right. But I didn't do another set until... September of 2015 uh, in Pittsburgh. All right, where, where was where was this, your first spot in Pittsburgh? Oh, Hambones, of course. Yeah, Thursday night or Monday? A Thursday night. It was it's, it's all, all, always. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a it's a Monday fun spot. night at Hambones turned into my favorite mic. Yeah, it's a great. I that's, mean, that's my favorite one. The, right the, on. the one that uh, Joey hosts. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But you were you were in a you were in a in a in a before you got into comedy. You were involved in an anarchic puppet show. Yeah, uh, an anarchist, uh, an, an anarchist puppet troupe uh, that toured all over the country uh, huh. for you know sometimes multiple months out of the year. I, I was the uh, main scriptwriter for it, and then we also helped perform and and uh, 
was responsible for some of the merch and stuff like that. Right on. Uh, it was super fun. Yeah, we did it for uh, almost eight years. Wow. And yeah, it was it was when that project ended that I was like, I really want to keep living like this, but I also don't want to do collaborative projects for the foreseeable future, you know? Right. Well, what put you off collaboration? Um, I really wanted control right. over projects. Um, I think I have some trust issues with progressively minded people yeah, because uh, I don't think they always act in their own best interest, you know? Sure. And I think, which, you know, is fine if you want to be a little altruistic, but I think they don't always even act in the group's best interest. So, like, for example, you know, I, we, our puppet troupe wound up bringing on an additional person, uh, and that person, their sense of humor was very different than mine. You right. know, yeah. uh, and their their style of dealing with conflict was very different than mine, uh, and their style of just dealing with people in general. You know, yeah. And uh, I feel like, you know, this this is weird to say, but I feel like because the two main people who had been doing it were dudes, me and another dude. Yeah. I feel like we felt like one of the things we wanted to do was diversify. Sure. You know, and I feel like. Uh, and th- you know, this is kind of where the like progressive trust issues come in. I feel like if that person had been a male, we would have seen those things as red flags, but we were oh. so excited to have, uh, a woman who was excited and enthusiastic about the project. And, you know, it, initially I think the, you know, the, the, so it was, it was just, it was, uh, you know, and I, yeah, I think we would have seen a really toxic personality as like a big red flag right. if, if it'd been a dude. Right. Uh, and, and I've just I've seen that happen with a lot of radical projects where like uh, people get real excited about I don't know like like um or like uh, you know uh, like if you're like have like a house you know that a bunch of you like go in on and buy or whatever and you're like trying to do like a cool collective house right. but it's like in a, maybe like a gentrifying neighborhood right you know and then you're like oh well like we want this you know to like be consistent with like community values or whatever well like what happens like when your neighbor gets evicted right and you're a bunch of like white punks or whatever living there, <laughs> you know, the right thing to do or whatever is to have your neighbor move in. But, like, what if your neighbor's also kind of a piece of shit? <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. and, and to me, that that's the problem with, with the progressive, like, altruistic mindset is that it, it makes bad decisions based on, like, what the, like, good thing to do is. Right, and you don't always know what the how things are going to turn out. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess to me that was part of it. It was, like, I wanted to have full control over the project um yeah and with comedy you definitely get full control it's you and a microphone and frankly i love the simplicity of it um so what what was it what can can you give us an example of uh uh radical uh uh, activism that you were involved in uh pre-comedy yeah i mean there was a lot of stuff um I was involved with the Earth First chapter in the state that I was living in. Uh, who are those guys? Uh, Earth First is a it's a one of the longest running direct action environmental groups. You know they they do, uh, you know they're kind of last resort yeah. type groups. Uh, they got really famous in the '90s. They were the ones doing all the tree sits in the redwoods, right, out right. in California. You know when they were trying to do all the old growth logging, right. Uh, more recently, you know I, they were the the kind of antagonists uh, down in Texas for the anti-Keystone XL yeah. uh, stuff. Sure. Um, they were a large portion of the, like, subcultural, like, non-native uh, folks who were up in uh, Standing Rock. All right. You know, and, and, and everything in between. You know, they, they ran um, the anti-I-69 campaign yeah. in, in the late 2000s. Um, uh, a lot of the anti fra they uh a, a Couture Earth First from Western North Carolina was um yeah. they partnered with uh, another NGO to start Mountain Justice which is like the anti mountain top removal right. stuff that goes on so i mean like earth first is they're a small a pretty small gr- like network around yeah. the country numbers wise but their influence and and dedication and like uh acceptance of of a wide variety of tactics i think makes them uh 
really influential, but kind of invisible in a lot of ways. Right on. So you're, you're doing some, some pretty uh, uh, intense activism. You, you, this is during the time you're in the puppet show or preceding the puppet show? Uh, during. So, like, the puppet troupe, usually we would take a month off of work and build a show. Yeah. And then we would tour for a month in the summer and a month in the winter. So it's about three months. So I've got another nine months out of the year where I'm, like, working. And, you know, during that during that time you can go to demonstrations and run reading groups and, uh, you know, table at events and stuff like that. And, and the, the stuff that we would do with the puppet troupe reflected the projects that we worked on. Sure. You know, so, like... My two favorite shows that we did, uh, one of them was a shadow puppet show uh, about two time travelers, uh, very similar to uh, Mr. Peabody and okay. and, and that, that kid, what's his name, from 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 Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yeah. You know, it was loosely based on that, except they're going back through the history of the uh, prison system from, like, slavery huh. through, like, uh, you know... Um, uh, convict leasing yeah. uh, to Jim Crow era, and then finally to the prison industrial complex and, and prison labor. Right. And kind of showing how it's all an, an unbroken chain. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, and and both you know, everyone in our group worked at the prison books, the the, the books to prisoners chapter yeah. in that town, and so a lot of the knowledge that was put into that show. Uh, came from our experience with that, and then also that traveling show was used to try to get people to start books to prisoners chapters in their towns, you All know, because right. yeah. we would give a talk afterwards, a little Q and a type thing. And people are like, well, what can we do about prisons? And we'd be like, well, one of the things you can do about prisons is like set up a books to prisoners chapter, right. you know, and send them in, uh, books, but also radical literature, you know, to help them organize. Yeah. And our, our books to prisoners chapter was very unapologetic about being <laughs> anarchists. You know, we, we would send in all kinds of Black Panther literature and shit right. from the 60s and 70s. Oh, wow. Um, as well as, like, a lot of the Black Panthers went on to become anarchists right. uh, afterwards and have, have written books and zines that we also sent in. Yeah. And then our the other puppet show I really liked was um, a scathing critique of kind of like green technology and green capitalism. Sure. R- written uh, into, like, a uh, Don Quixote Thank style you, yeah. style tale, you yeah. know. Yeah, like well, you know, right? Because he, he 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 sees windmills. Well, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, he, he, he sees was windmills as giants. Yeah, he was yeah. against the industrialization for sure. I mean, he yeah. was fighting it with a sword. Yeah, Sancho Panza. It's great. Um, all right, so uh, <clears throat> so you're an activist who's doubling as a puppet as a as a puppeteer as well as as an organ organizer and writer on the puppet show, and then s- what happens? that leads you into comedy and where does it comedy starts in the Carolinas and it comes up to Pittsburgh and you've been here for a year or so. Uh, I mean, now I've been here almost three years. All right. But yeah. Um, what happens? I mean, I hit a wall with activism. I think like we, we had had like pretty generic activist projects, you know, campaigns against stuff. And it seemed like every time one of our campaigns would start really getting up off the ground and going, you'd get a lot of police interference, you know, like All harassing right. the people working on the campaign. And eventually, like, just like bullshit charges handed down to yeah. to organizers, like the, the I-69 campaign I was talking about with Earth First. Uh, two of the organizers got charged with uh, the RICO Act, which is like... Like conspiracy, ra- yeah, it's a like conspiracy and racketeering and shit. It, it, right. It's intended for like the mafia, right? Right. You know, right. It's not intended for activists running an interstate campaign against you know the NAFTA superhighway or whatever, right. like, or like fracking or yeah, you know. exactly. And so they, you know, that the thing that we kind of the I'd say that that was my first wall. Yeah, was with like normal activism. That <clears throat> that was when I really became like an anarchist. Yeah, you know, where I was like, oh, you can't have a real successful campaign to, like, really stop something that really challenges, like, the financial bottom line. Right. You know? Uh, and so that was when I became an... Because the government always intervenes. Sure. And crushes the campaign. Sure. And so that was when I really became an anarchist. And, uh... <clears throat> the, I would say... And, and, you know, at that point, our goal was essentially to, yeah, destabilize the, the U.S. government and undermine it and weaken it, you know, to the point where you could kind of have it out with the corporations i guess sure uh and that was that was a big miscalculation on our part you know Hmm. i think um we underestimated how far right the country is as a whole yeah um and also 
kind of how things shake out when you get a destabilized country, you know? Because the models <clears throat> that we'd been looking at were like Argentina mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of Latin American countries, you know? So we were looking at like the Zapatistas, right, who like use the fact that the Mexican state is kind of weak okay. and kind of, oh, and, and is always preoccupied to like reclaim their own territory. And, right. you know, we, yeah, we were looking at like Argentina where, uh, when the economic crash happened in 2002, you know, all these, uh, people like took over their own neighborhoods. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and it, it ended up being a positive thing for them. Right. Yeah. And it was. And so we, we were kind of looking at those models and then a really different narrative, came during the Arab Spring. All right. You know, where Egypt went from being a dictatorship and then they they sh they threw off the dictatorship, you know, with with like an insurrectionary rioting right. method, which was kind of the thing that we'd been promoting in the US, you All know, right. like um we were doing the like Black Lives Matter style rioting before before uh Ferguson and that kind of stuff, like All if right. you uh and so I mean on on a much smaller scale, obviously. Yeah. It it hadn't for, for Ferguson was on a much larger scale, but this this idea that when the police kill somebody, right, you don't just peacefully protest. You you get upset. Yeah, you, you you act. Yeah, shit gets you know. Yeah, real. Uh, and so, and and you know that was kind of what the Books to Prisoners project was about too, right? Was like educating prisoners in a way, and you see it now, right? Like the Books to Prisoners projects all over the country sent in a lot of radical literature, and I don't think it's a coincidence that now you see a lot of prison organizing and prison uprisings that you didn't see 15 years ago. Right on. You know? Um, and, but yeah, but when, when man, when, when Egypt, you know, became an even worse dictatorship than it had been before, and then Syria collapsed into civil war right. in this way where... I think the U.S. would do something very similar because the right, the, the religious right here is yeah. so much better armed and better organized than the left. That it's like, yeah, if you actually had like a civil war style situation, yeah, you'd have fucking like white Christian ISIS huh. in no time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And they would probably win because they know how to yeah. shoot guns and Yeah. And you'd, and you'd, you'd, you'd have the government versus them and the left would be just, as, the, the, the like secular whatever left would be just as irrelevant as they are in Syria. Right. Like who the fuck has heard from the left in Syria in the right. last five years? Right. Nobody. Right. You yeah. Because they, they don't, they don't have any, any power, any military. Yeah. So, I mean, that. That was a big wall for me, and I would say the final straw that kind of happened at the same time was the Snowden uh, stuff with the NSA, where, uh -huh. like, in my mind, I think I had always thought... Because uh, we knew about a lot of the surveillance stuff, because we'd seen hints about it in court, you know, where, like, right. the, the FBI or whoever has evidence that they shouldn't have, right. you know? Right, 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 right. Um, and stuff, and... And you're talking about the mass surveillance program that is happening on the internet by the U.S. government for our own quote-unquote protection. Right. Yeah. yeah. And 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 so and I, somewhere in my brain, I was like, all this information would never get out. But if it did, if it got out like all at once, and yeah. everyone just found out all this shit at the same time, like right. something crazy would happen. Right. Right. You know? Like like we would all have like, to act. Yeah. It, it would be we would be pushed to the point of no return. You know. And then it all came out and just it. Did. Nothing happened. Nothing popped. Nothing happened. And I think, I think for me, those, those watching those two things happen in like the same course of like a year and a half or whatever yeah. was just like really disillusioning. I didn't feel like I had any more answers. That's basically when I switched to comedy. Yeah. Uh, because I was like, I still think about these things all the time, and I still fixate on them. And right. I still need to talk about them, but like, I can't give these presentations where I tell people what I think the answers to them are anymore because right. I fucking have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, answers are the hardest thing to find. So, uh, wait, how's, it, how's it translate in the comedy? You, uh, you, 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 you have all this experience and a unique perspective and then you're like... I'm not. I'm not working on on uh, on anarchist campaigns or or uh, puppet shows, but I want to still be a voice in in the greater community. And comedy comes in. What do you mean? Well, 
I mean, uh, I don't know if we, this is the third take we've taken, so I don't know if we discussed the bridge in this, in this, did we, did we discuss the bridge between the yeah, puppet yeah, show? Yeah, yeah, no, and... I, I think we did, where it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing comedy writing, yeah. you know, for the puppet troupe, and I'm doing public speaking, like, giving, like, anti-fracking presentations all over my state, yeah. and, uh... What brought you up to Pittsburgh? Well, my family lives here, actually, all so right. when, when I was, like, I'm done with activism... Right. And uh, the projects that I had where I was living kind of fell apart because of some, like, in-scene drama. Uh, I was like, I haven't lived near my parents in, like, probably 12 years, you yeah, know? Yeah. And they're, they they were at that really golden age <laughs> where, like, they'd retired. Right. Uh, at least my mom had, you know? And so, yeah. like, had the time to hang out with me, but, like, was still, like, physically capable of, like, riding bikes and shit. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a small window, sure. you know? Sure. That, that, and and once once that window closes, it's it's shut. It's done. You know. So like uh, a couple of years before I moved here, me and my mom and my brother, uh, when they finished the the rails to trails thing from uh, Pittsburgh to DC, yeah, we biked it together. Yeah. And I think we all had a really good time, and it was kind of this like eye opening thing. I think for all of us, where we were like, "Yo, we should do more stuff like this." That's cool. And have you done more stuff like that? Embarrassingly enough, <laughs> nothing on that scale. But but I, I I do get to go hiking with my mom sometimes, you know, and yeah. I, and and I do get to like go walk her dogs with her and stuff. And 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 you know, yeah, we I, I I spend a lot more time with them now, you know. So that's that that is nice, you know. I get to go see movies with my dad and 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 you know, especially when I first moved here, we were like going shooting and stuff, and yeah. it was like it was fun, you know. Yeah. All right. So um. Uh, all right. Where do we, where where do we go from here? What do you think? Um, so, I mean, I don't know, I guess I, in one of the previous takes we did, you kind of asked me, like, and we, and, and we got into the, the how I got through activism thing or whatever. Yeah. Asked me, like, what I do in my own life now. And that's, that's kind of, that was the tough question I didn't really have an answer to because it was like, I, I kind of don't, like, I, I kind of just try to have fun now, but not, not like... Well, I mean, I know that that, that you haven't you haven't let go of it completely because it's it's in your it's in your your stand up for yeah. sure. Well, I mean, it's in my stand up. It's in in the way I live my life, but maybe not. Like, I don't I don't really think anything any of it makes a difference. I just think it's like a good way to live. Like, it's it's almost like weirdly nihilistic in that way, where it's like uh, I need to talk to people about this stuff because it's making me crazy. Yeah, but like. I don't feel this pressure to do it in, like, the most effective way possible right. anymore. Right. Like, I kind of think that we're, like, maybe, like, the last generation of free people living on this planet. I mean, I think... The bankers are going to get us, huh? Well, just the level of interconnectivity and surveillance and technology is hitting such a point that, like... Like, I think the next generation of... Like, Facebook... I mean, again, some wingnutty territory here, but it's not yeah. really wingnutty. But I mean, like... Facebook and Elon Musk are both working on something called Neuralink technology. Where like, All right. you and I are talking into a phone right now. Right. The concept of having an external device yeah. that you use for all this internet shit that you have to that, that like breaks and falls in the toilet and that you right. have to like hold with your hands yeah. is going to be considered fucking archaic in forty years. Yeah. And basically, it's neural lace. It sets on your brain. Right. And you, you know, it's it's uh, what's it called like. Um, what uh, you see will go on your page or yeah, whatever. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, uh, aug 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 augmented reality, you right, know. Right, Um Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the future. And at that point, right... You think that's, that's what's going to happen? That 100%. You can't escape it? I mean... Yeah, I mean, and, and again, it's not going to be like legally enforced, but it's going to be socially. socially enforced in the same way that Facebook cell phones, and yeah. cell phones and cars, right. right? Nothing forces you to have a driver's <laughs> license, you right. know. There's no law that says you do, but right. like, unless but if you, you want to get to work on yeah, time, unless get you live in New York City or whatever, yeah. or San Francisco, yeah. You, well, actually, no. If if you live in New York, you still have to have a fucking idea. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and and it's like credit cards and shit, right? We're like, like. You don't need to have a credit card. There's no, and, and I don't just mean credit. I mean like debit, whatever you yeah. want to say. You, you're really a, you're legally allowed to do everything in cash, but like, good fucking luck. <laughs> like you, you're not getting on an airplane with cash. Yeah. You know, you're not even getting a Greyhound ticket with cash. Right. 
you know, your your stores around you keep closing. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and you can't shop online with cash. Right. You know, so it's like you you can't pay your phone bill with cash. No, no. Like, and if you have a lot of cash, yeah. that's evidence of a crime. <laughs> like, like if you have a few thousand bucks in the car with you, like the police can seize that, and you base the onus is basically on you to prove that wow. it's not for a crime. You know, so I mean, yeah. it's it's yeah. I mean, I think I think not having neural lace technology is gonna is gonna greatly hamper your ability. To, I mean, like if I didn't have the internet right now, like. I work at some, well, I, until literally two days ago, I worked at some restaurant chain. And it's like, if I didn't have the internet, like, I couldn't have had a schedule. Right. You like, know? Yeah, that's how they communicated with yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and and if I didn't have the internet on a phone, oh, yeah. like, I couldn't have put my shifts up for other people to take or taken other people's shifts. Right. So it's just the, the practicality. We're, so we're going to get sidelined into having brain implants that are basically cell phones on our brains. Yeah, and at that point, right, you can't get rid of your tracking device. Right. And furthermore, if you can, if you can, de- and, and this this isn't some crazy technology that doesn't exist yet, right? right. They're already using that kind of technology for uh, for prosthetics, yeah. where like you know. Um, for like people who like get their arms blown off and shit. Sure. Like you can get an arm and they literally wire it so it it goes to the nerves in your brain and you can control that arm with your thoughts it's just incredible. like you can control your regular arm. So this isn't yeah. this isn't like some crazy technology that might come out like right. this it's shit exists. Yeah. yeah, it's just a matter of getting it cheap enough. Right. Which everything gets cheap enough eventually. eventually. So yeah, and at that point, I mean y- you're you're talking about right if if you can download information from the internet into your brain right. and upload information from your brain into the internet, right. then people who are not you can force you to download stuff the same way they do it now. Right. You know? Where, like, people put shit on... Cookies and shit on your computer. Right. Viruses on your fucking computer. Oh, my God. And they steal information from your computer, too. Right? Sure, 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 and sure. That, that's your fucking brain in 50 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to make sure my... my uh, what... Uh, the security company that I hire to protect my computer is always paid on time. Right? Well, and, and just, like... Like, I mean, if you think about this, like, like, and net neutrality, um, right, where if, if, if we're increasingly responsible for having larger and larger, for, like, even now, right, we're switching from, uh, what's called encyclopedic knowledge to what's yeah. called, like, reference knowledge, right? right? So it's, like, the difference between, like, remembering facts yeah. and remembering where to find facts. Right, right, right. You right. know? Yeah. Um, and... Which is a, f- a fundamental shift in the way the human... And it, it, it's one we've been going on for a long time, cause, right? Because people hoard books. Yeah. I, I hoard books. I like books. Yeah, I fucking love books. Yeah. But uh, when those books are on the internet, yeah. then those books can be edited. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and they change. And, and so that that is your prosthetic... Me- like, my book collection is sort of my... And, and like, my pile of journals at home yeah. is sort of a prosthetic memory to sure, me. Sure, right? sure, sure, sure. You, you can go back and reference yeah. it at any time. And if your prosthetic memory is online... Sure. Then someone can edit your memory where you... Th- thought it wasn't that but it guess it is. you know like wow. like I, I sure thought your phone number was you know nine two two four two eight six but right. says here in my fucking memory that it's <laughs> not so you know so you think they're gonna literally turn our brains into our computers i mean it's not a matter of turning them into but it once they're hooked up using it that way kind of you know where uh-huh. it once once you're once you have an expanded memory via the internet yeah. then it's not a matter of editing your brain it's just a matter of editing all the storage that your brain has access to sure right and your your brain is just a giant reference tool your actually encyclopedic knowledge yeah. is all elsewhere well you know this this reminds me of my most favorite uh uh, episode of a TV show called The Outer Limits is that there was an episode that I saw when I was, I was I must have been 12 or 13 years old and everyone had got this sort of neural download thing and they were all connected by a centralized computer that was massive and then one day the computer turned like Hal in 2001 A Space Odyssey and started destroying people and and the the only person that could possibly save them was was a person who who whose biology kept 
uh, rejecting the, the, the link into, into his brain. So he was forced to gain knowledge in what was the archaic fashion of reading books. And he was the only one who was capable. And then he did save the human race from total annihilation. Wow. I got to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. But yeah. So, I mean, like, like, and then when you get into net neutrality, right, if all your knowledge is stored elsewhere, right. your ability to reference that knowledge at the same speed as someone else right. is dictated by Whoa. an outside force, right? Yeah, and then that's those are like up, upgrades and, 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 and uploads, so it would depend, your intelligence would depend on how much money you had. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah, and we already live in a society where a lot of times your they intelligence have all the anyway. your intelligence influences how much money you have. So right. now you're stuck in a fucking feedback loop, right? Yeah. Cuz like we're we're working we're living in a society now that really devalues manual labor. Yeah. So it's like your ability to be like autistically mathematic yeah. is already uh, you know, the thing that, like, you know, gets you coding jobs and, and right, right. Be- better jobs than you and I have. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, sure. Uh, I mean, soulless, but, like, you right. know, quote, better, whatever. Right, but we'll hire pay and security yeah. and, and all, the, all that great stuff. And so, yeah, basically you get one of these jobs and then you can get your own brain upgrades and then you can keep moving up the ladder, you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I mean, do you think that something like that, one, one, one of these, these information loops, like a, a really dumb person uh, inherits a, a shit ton of money and just starts making it impossible for anyone to upgrade their their uh, prosthetic brain, except for them, and then they crash the society in, into into a uh, what, what was what was that movie where where everybody's dumb in the future and we feed Gatorade to plants? Uh, idiocracy. Yeah, you think that we're headed in uh, on on the uh, we're on like a, a 70, 80 mile an hour road to idiocracy. I hope you're right. <laughs> I absolutely hope you're right. And I'll tell you why I hope you're right. Why? Because I saw something. I don't remember who it was. I would love to credit them. There's someone where they were like, idiocracy yeah. is a fucking utopia. <laughs> no, do you want to know why? Yeah, I want to know why. Because they took the person that they thought was the smartest person yeah. and made him the fucking president. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. We don't even pretend to do that. <laughs> no, okay, okay, that's a great <laughs> like, point. Like, it's like true. A, a smart guy showed up one day that yeah. obviously knew more than everyone else, and they were <laughs> and like, they oh, put that ruler. guy in charge. Yeah, yeah. yeah we... we we try to put people in charge like the kind of guy you'd want to have a beer with. Right, the right. The fuck kind of a way to select someone is that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. But no, I, um... But, the, but to get back to what I was saying, like, I think... Yeah. So, yeah, I think in many ways, like, we are the last free generation. Oh, man, and that's so part a scary of, thought. Part of me is kind of just, like... I don't know if there's anything you can do to kind of stop the gears. And part of me is just, like, I should just live like the last free <laughs> generation. Oh, you know? my like, God. Maybe, like, cosmically owe it to just, like... <laughs> take advantage of the fact that there's no fucking wiring in my brain and like spend as much time in the woods yeah. as possible, like you know? Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, tr- I mean, so I said, I, I just ditched my restaurant job. I yeah. swapped it for, um, starts tomorrow, Okay. which by the time this airs will be days ago, uh, working in the woods with like high school students doing like trail maintenance and stuff. Right. And I'm super excited for that. But yeah, I mean, and yes, it's like societally a good job, you yeah. know, like, I mean, not pay wise, but like karma or, or ultra, whatever yeah. fucking, but really I just, I think it's going to be fun. Sure. You know, and I think that that's. So what are you doing? You're working with kids? Yeah. So basically the city hires kids to do trail maintenance in the parks and, uh, I'm going to be a, fucking manager which is the first, right. I'm 34 and it'll be the first management job I've ever had in my <laughs> life I've fought tooth and nail to avoid that position for yeah. two decades of employment now <laughs> All right, so uh, I I I know that you have some peculiar interests. Uh would would you would you say that your favorite author is Ted Kaczynski? I, not my favorite author. Okay. Um, Your favorite activist? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think... Uh, I mean, Edward Abbey might be one of my favorite... Well, really, my favorite author is this, this guy from the Bay Area named Aaron Comet Bus, who okay. wrote this punk zine called Comet Bus <laughs> for like 30 fucking years. And yeah. every time he comes out with something new, I drop whatever I'm doing and I read that <laughs> cover to cover. But... Um, as far as, like, important thinkers go, yeah, yeah, we can take a minute. Uh, yeah, I think 
Ted Kaczynski's critique of technology is, you know, in in uh, industrial society and its future, uh, also known as the Unabomber Manifesto, right, uh, is was spot on, you yeah. know, and kind of unfuckwithable and and absolutely holds up. Uh, what twenty five, twenty eight years later? Yeah. To, sorry, twenty three years later. You know, right. I mean, like it's it's a brilliant document, and also. You know, and I, I didn't think this 15 years ago, but I also think that his critique of the way that the left basically actually just reinforces technological society. How so? Um, because it, the left has like a really like managerial tendency, you yeah. know? So like, they're, the left is like Wile E. Coyote with state power, where like they always have a new scheme that they think this time it's gonna work. Oh, all right. You know, but it yeah. always blows up in their fucking face. Yeah. Well, like what though? So okay, so like, like um, right now, right, we have this like crazy surveillance state, and if you want to protest and not lose your fucking job or yeah. like get harassed at home later by the police, you have to cover your face. Yeah. You know, when Make when you sure go to protest, Facebook doesn't see you. Right, but. You've got these anti-masking laws in half the in half the country, really? and they're all left over from uh, anti-Klan ordinances. Oh my God! Right, and so it's like, like yeah, fuck the Klan to death, right? Like I right. mean, I've I've gone to demonstrations, you know, with fucking bats, you know, to deal with those people or whatever. Like I'm I'm one of the bad protesters, whatever you want to call it. But like, right. like I don't care for those people. Yeah. Um, but like. Also, like, that's what happens when you give the state power is it winds up getting used against you. Right. You know, and similarly, I, I see it happening now, right, with um, uh, body cameras, right? Like, the our, our solution to police brutality. Like, 15 years ago, when the police wanted to intimidate you at a demonstration, yeah. they stuck a camera in your face. Really? Right? They, they come to your demonstration and they have a fucking video camera and they're taping you all and putting all right. it up. And now... Every interaction you have with a police officer is going to be them, them shoving a camera in your face, right? Oh, my God. And and we're already seeing, like, uh, you know, the inauguration protests yeah. from 2017, they charged, and the cases are falling apart, fortunately, but they charged over 200 people with felonies for protesting at Trump's inauguration. Jeez. And a lot of the evidence they said they had was from police body cameras. Yeah. You know, you turn every single police officer into a roaming CCTV. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's something to think about, whether or not that's the world you want to live in. And, you know, they've convinced us that it's for our own protection, but like... Yeah. I... I and, and again, it, and the... You know, it's not some devious plot by the left. Like, right. on an individual basis... Body cameras will probably save some lives. Sure. But killing people is not the only thing police officers do. Sure. They also facilitate a 2.3 million person fucking prison slave industry. Right. Right? So, like, whatever... Like, their ability to build evidence on people yeah. is not a thing that we want to facilitate. <laughs> you know? And so, like... That, and, and to me, that's that's the problem is is the left always does things for safety, right? Where it's right. like, okay, it's like this is like a dangerous area. We want, like, women to feel safe walking in this area. What do you do? Put security cameras in, sure. right? And, like, and, and now even you see the left, I know this is fucking controversial to say, but you see the left trying to get uh, corporations to police certain political speech right. on oh, the I'm internet. A, I'm 100% against censorship of it's, all kinds. And it's, you know, I understand why. Like, yeah. I, like again, I've said, like, I I don't respect Nazis' free speech. Right. Like, I will go to a fucking demonstration for a fight. Like, I, <laughs> I fully support Antifa. Um, but I also think it's different when civilians do it. You yeah. know, I, 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 think, I think suppressing people's free speech has to be illegal and also done anyway. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I, I don't want... I don't want the societal shift yeah. where major corporations and the government suppress free speech. I right. would rather me and my friends sometimes have to catch a charge <laughs> to suppress some fucking Nazis right. than giving the government and increasingly corporations the power to decide who does and doesn't get to speak. Sure. You know, yeah. um, kind of in the, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, 
like it's it's a gritty area. You know, like I I don't have any black and whites on it, but it's like uh anytime you give the government the ability to suppress speech, it's going to blow up on the face in the face of the left because sure. they have such a right-wing government. E- even when the Democrats are in office, it's still like a pretty right-wing government, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like unions are always the fucking target. Mm-hmm. Activists are always the fucking target. Socialists are always the target. Anarchists are, always, you know, I mean like, whatever civil rights movement is going on is always getting targeted by the fucking government. You don't want to give those people any more power than you have to. Right. Well, I mean, they want, they already have the power and they want to keep it. So, yeah, so essentially Ted's argument uh, yeah. is that the left is basically like the loyal opposition to right. to society, but that it actually pushes forward most of the, like, control and micromanagerial agendas, but in the name of altruism and right. and in the name of uh you know humanitarianism so what is the way out that's why i'm a comedian now <laughs> I, mean, I, I definitely think technology is the crux like i think technology goes across like anti-technology sentiment can go across right and left right right because everyone likes privacy and everyone likes sure i mean everyone likes their own privacy yeah 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 we need to get comfortable with each other's privacy right uh you know and everyone likes their own freedom right to get a little more comfortable with other people's freedom (laughs) you know uh but yeah i mean to me technology is the crux because i think like and i I guess i don't know that i'm revolutionary anymore you know but i that that's why I don't have an answer because I don't think you can non-revolutionarily walk back technology. Yeah. Um, but I also don't think we can let technology expand the way that it that it wants does, to. You know, because yeah, well, like, so I mean, if you look at it, like, like the U.S. government, let's say even under Obama, right? I think we can probably say that that's a a chiller, more democratic, more progressive government than like, like. East Berlin under the fucking Stasi in, well, yeah. in the seventies, right? Except yeah. that like the Obama administration has way more informa- had way more information on your average civilian than the oh, Stasi yeah. ever did. Oh, just yeah. because they can. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so of that's course. that's the thing is like political will isn't the thing that dictates whether or not a, a government engages in surveillance. Capacity does. Yeah. And so like that's to me why technology not political agenda is really the issue yeah. you know like they need to not have the ability to surveil people that way that's the only thing that stops them not I'm... yeah I, I i i could agree to to an extent i mean but do you, what are the chances though i i don't i don't see us going back unless we absolutely have to people love the internet they love the cell phones and technology and despite the establishment and all their powers it really does lead us it gives us a good tool against uh 1984 kind of uh dystopia no no nah, I, I i disagree but i mean but again like this is why i'm kind of like why i do think it's sort of like why at this point I just make fun of it basically, you know, like, like I, I don't have the answers anymore. And that is why I'm kind of just like, I'm just going to make fun of it and spend as much time in the woods <laughs> as I can and try to like, I don't know, like live, live the best life you can because I, I do, I view it as kind of, I mean, I don't mean to be a fucking bummer, but like, <laughs> yeah, I view it as kind of like an unstoppable juggernaut that is going to, is going to run its course essentially. And I don't yeah. know what that means. Right. I don't think what we're doing is sustainable. Right. Uh, I do think we're on a collision course, and I'm not smart enough to know exactly what kind of collision course that is. But you know, that's that's why I'm I'm always kind of trying to move in a more woodsy. Yeah. Well, direction. you know, I I think I think the comedy uh, will give get really gives you a voice in in society, and if if you get enough people. To, in, in an audience, yeah, you could still make a difference. I mean, what what kind of what kind of messages do you think are still relevant for you today? I mean, I do still think that aggressive conflict with the government and the corporations yeah. is really important. Uh, I think that is how change actually gets made. Yeah, you know, I I don't. I, I spend a lot of time touring and hanging out with another comic, Chris Mohan. All right, yeah, I think I like it's Chris. fucking brilliant. Sure. Uh, he is a huge advocate of peaceful civil disobedience, and it's like the argument that we have nonstop. Where I actually don't 
think that that is a viable path to change. I I do <laughs> think I I do think that like Standing Rock style open conflict no. is and sometimes you know sometimes you got to start super peaceful the way they did you yeah. know, but I I do think it has to build you know I think. I, I think conflict is is what drives change. Sure. <clears throat> um, with that said, I don't have a, a roadmap for that anymore. You know, I'm I'm fucking out of answers. Uh, the fact that I ever thought I had them, you know, was mid twenties hubris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, looking back on it, it gives you some some stuff to make comedy out of, though. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you know, that's that's the content, right? Well, and 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 the way that that having been that dumb affects my life. I'm, I don't. Again, we're on, like, our third take here because of technological <laughs> issues. But, right. like, like yeah, like, the fucking FBI came to my house this time last year. Yeah. Because, you know, the area that I used to live in a few years before that, someone burned down the fucking GOP office right before the election. Wow. You know? Uh, so, I mean, it still informs, you know, and, and, and I, I, you know, didn't didn't answer their questions, you know, well, I, yeah. I didn't let them, inter- I, I won't say I didn't answer, I, I didn't let them interview me, you know, right. like, I was just like, I don't know anything about that, yeah. you know, yeah, um, sure. I didn't slam the door in their face, which is what you should really do, because they're some <laughs> tricky motherfuckers, and sure. you're not smarter than them, yeah. um, but, yeah, I, you know, and, 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 which if people want to know more about that, I have a video up on YouTube of me telling that story on stage <laughs> one night. Um, it's a good, it's a good, it's, it's worth a watch because it's funny and it's true and I love it when the truth is hilarious. I mean, every, all, all my content is, is always true. You know, it's always yeah. coming out of, coming out of my, my hopes and dreams or my fears or my anxieties about shit. Um, sure. you know, like, I mean, like you were saying, like a lot of my stuff is about how, how the things that we do, yeah. uh, to try to make change are, are you know, the things that end up trapping our, us. Our, our, our tail chasing <laughs> yeah. that's, that's pushed on us yeah. by people who don't actually want change to happen, you know? Sure. Uh, it's like green capitalists and green technologists that want us to believe that that's, that's the route out. Right. You know, when actually what we need is like to way simplify our society and our lives. Um, you know, uh, Ted Kaczynski, to bring it back to him, said something <laughs> where he's, he's like, you know, the thing that they do you know that they they hold my cabin against me. You know right. they they always point to my cabin, right? And the way that I was living to show how fucking crazy I was. Sure. But if everyone lived that way, like we wouldn't have hardly any of the problems that we have in the world right now. Right. You know. So who's fucking crazy? It's his, uh, yeah. Still him because he went around blowing people up. But right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, <laughs> right. Right. I mean, well, he but, made a but, few but, good but, points. But 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 the thing is, and we were talking about this before, like he wasn't always on that trajectory. Like, that right. dude could have been the next Thoreau. Like, he bought land out in Montana, yeah. built himself a hut, and was just living out there journaling. Literally right. just like Thoreau. And they came and they logged all around him. Yeah. And he was like, holy shit, y- there's nowhere to, to run from yeah. the fucking techno death machine. <laughs> you know, they, they brought the fight to him and you can agree or disagree with the way he responded. But like, right. like no one can say that he didn't try to just like drop out and do his own thing, you yeah. know? And it is it, the problem with our society is that the option to drop out really isn't there. Not anymore. You know, no. that's, and it, we, I think this was in our last interview, but where I was saying where like, People think that America is too individualistic, right. and actually, I think it's a false individualism because we don't have a lot of options. Right. You actually can't go live in the fucking woods if you want. You can't go live off the grid with your friends. Like most states, yeah. trying to raise a child without plumbing is considered child abuse, and they'll take your fucking kid from you. Yeah. You know, they'll condemn your fucking house. They'll huh. say you can't live there, and they'll take your fucking kid from you if you try to raise them off the grid. Right. Um. You know, it, it's weird. Like, people in my line of thinking oftentimes have, like, weird overlap with, like, nutty Christians on, like, the homeschooling and stuff, you know? But <laughs> sure. it's, 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 it's kind of true, you know? Where, yeah. like, the option to live certain ways is, is not available to us anymore. Yeah. I don't know. Awesome. All right, so, uh,. Got any upcoming shows? Yeah, man, I kind of wing nutted out on this episode. No, I, it's, it's been it's been great, 
Um, it's, yeah, it's I, been a, it's been a win. You, you got to understand that this is today was a Murphy's Law kind of day. There were some communication lines crossed with uh, my producer Todd DeFazio. So instead of having two microphones and a producer in in uh, in the loft of a very large bar, we're out in my car talking on on my you know using my cell phone as a as a microphone, and it's kind of appropriate given the the guests that I have and. There's no way I was I was gonna uh, you know change it for another day, especially so I drove all the way out to Pittsburgh to do this interview. You came all the way out here from your place, I, and I kind of think that this style for you, uh, considering who you are and your belief system and everything, is kind of the more perfect solution anyway. Well, yeah, well, and and then like yeah, we we got our. our our audio file got wiped like half an hour yeah. into the first yeah. go. And so then I'm like trying to remember what I've said and what yeah, I haven't yeah, said. No, me I'm, too. Like, I'm like, is the thing that I'm referencing right now making any fucking sense? <laughs> like, is it in this take or right. am I, or, or am I repeating myself for this? Yeah, no, so it's, 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 it's been a trip, but uh, yeah, I, I, so I'm, I'm taking a little hiatus from comedy right now. Right. I do have two shows coming up um, because they were unusual shows. And so I, I agreed to them, but I've, I've, cause I, I have training for my new job because they, they don't let you just work with a bunch of kids without teaching you some specific shit. That's Dude, probably a good thing. Yeah, I, I I had to go in and get FBI fingerprinted last week. How do you uh, feel about that? I mean, you know how I feel about that. But <laughs> but, but anyway, but, uh, yeah, the two shows I have coming up, uh, I'm doing Zach Seepley's, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, uh, his show, he's got uh, Shut Up Stupid, Yeah. which is at the is it Parkland Theater? Park, the Parkway Theater yeah, in McKees Rocks. Yeah, at the Parkway Rocks. Theater in McKees Rocks yeah. uh, on June 8th. At 10.30 at night, it's like a political talk show. Nice. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm super excited about that. And then the other one, uh, Gab Benesso invited me to be on Celebrity Sofa on the 15th at the Brillo Box. It's an all-serial killer uh, edition <laughs> where I will be Ted Kaczynski. And I kind of... <laughs> this is a little bit of a compromise for me because I disagree with the classification of Ted Kaczynski as a serial killer. Right. I think he is a... More of a mass murderer? No, uh, I would say a terrorist oh, or, or, okay. or or an urban guerrilla, right? Like All the, right. The US, the U.S. culture doesn't really have context for, like, uh, for political violence, yeah. right? But in the same way that you wouldn't call, like... like I mean, say what you want about Che Guevara or whatever, but like, <laughs> you wouldn't call him a, a serial killer. Right. You know? Right. It, it's, it's, it's politically motivated. Yeah. It's strategic. You can disagree with the politics. You can disagree with the strategy. You can have total ethical qualms. Right. But, like, we don't consider your average, like, soldier in the American army a, like, serial, a killer. serial killer. No, you know absolutely what I mean? not. And, and so, to me, I don't think he really falls in serial killer, but uh, the opportunity... To play him on stage, yeah. Uh, I'm actually getting copies of the manifesto printed to distribute at the event. Really? You know? Oh yeah. No, yeah it I'm, sounds I'm, like it's gonna be great. I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm be in character. I'm, I'm, I'm a plug his fucking book. I don't, yeah. I, I don't want. Wanna... You gonna wear like a scraggly coal miner's beard and get some long hair? And... Oh uh, well, I'm, I'm probably gonna go with the FBI sketch version where okay. he's actually relatively clean shaved except for a mustache. Okay. With the glasses and the hoodie, the classic. You yeah, know the, I mean? the classic. All right, yeah. yeah that makes I, sense. I, I, I can't grow a beard to save my fucking life, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm out on that one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Awesome, awesome. Oh, and I, the thing I've been kind of distracting myself from comedy. The reason I took off from comedy is I wanted to make sure I was putting full time into. Uh, my 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 new job just to make sure that that like works out because yeah, hopefully sure. it's going to be a springboard for other similar jobs. Right. But the thing I've been doing to distract myself and and kind of have that like creative output is I have uh, an anti tech meme page yeah. that I put something up on every single day. It's uh, at feral meme, uh, f e r a l m e m e right. uh, on Instagram. All right, and uh, I like it. Awesome. You know, a hundred. 30 people, which is a really small number, but you know, again, it's, it's not a mainstream comedy style, right? Yeah. Like it's very specific. It's, it's for people who like it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so. All right. So, and we can, we can find, uh, other links to other, your future stuff, uh, you have Facebook yeah, and Twitter. So, uh, at Mike Cohen comedy is my Instagram, is my Twitter, is my Facebook and is my YouTube channel. Awesome. Uh, I've got four videos up on YouTube. I've got like my my first seven minute set or whatever. I've got two stories, one about hitchhiking and one about the FBI visiting me. And then I've got a new one that I just put up in February, 
Uh, that's like my new shit that I'm really happy with. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, that's all on my YouTube page. People should check it out. That's fantastic. All right. You've been listening to Scotty Presents. I'm your host, Scott Israel. We've had Michael Cohen on today, and uh, I think it, I think it went pretty well. You feel good about it? Thank you so much for having me on. It's yeah. it, it's a blast to get to hang out with you again as well. Like I like I, mean, I like hanging out with you too. Yeah, I, lo- I love the. Those... I mean, to to really put uh, the way that I feel about you in the perspective is, I think I told you this earlier. When I walk into any given room. I expect the, to be the off-the-wall crazy bastard in the room. And and it's very rare. Like, I can count on one hand how many times somebody beat me in that arena or even came close. And, and I, I think I think it's a, a distinction of, of praise. And that's the way that I feel about you is here's a guy whose thoughts and opinions about life and society and being a human being are far enough outside the box to... to 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 prove that that I've got competition in in my wackadoodle theories. <laughs> and, uh, uh. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, after those far, uh, th- those Eastern PA shows kind of dried up, <laughs> we, 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 we didn't have a good excuse to hang out. I'm one of those people like needs an excuse to hang out with folks, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm so bad at just being like, hey, let's just hang out, you right. know? So, yeah, no, it dried up, and I'm, I'm glad we got to sit down again. 